We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. Uh, thank you very much for everyone uh, to be here. And uh, even with this very bumpy start, thank you very much also to the IGF organizers that are really doing their best effort in these ve still very, very challenging uh, situations that we, every one uh, of us is facing. Uh, my name is Luca Belli. I'm professor at FGV Law School, uh, where I head the Center for Technology and Society. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of this uh, Internet Commons Forum, which, together with an amazing group of friends, especially Adam Burns, Jane Coffin, Alec Tarkovsky, and many other, many other friends from APC, including Henriette and Carlos Ray Moreno, that I'm not sure is here with us now. I would really like to, to thank everyone for being here. And uh, I will not uh, present every, every speaker now, because we have a quite long list of speakers, but we will introduce each speaker when they will speak. Uh, just to give you, to provide you a little bit of context of why we are here for the third time, actually. Uh, this is the uh, third uh, Internet Commons Forum that we organize together with the IGF uh, as a standalone uh, event that then became a session due to the pandemics. And we are, st we are planning to expanding this since a couple of years, but also the pandemic is planning to expand since a couple of years, that, and the two things are not really compatible. And uh, so the, the, the goal of this Internet Commons Forum is to bring thinkers, doers, policymakers under the same roof so that they can share their strategic thinking, their best practices, their stories, their ideas about how we can construct a less concentrated, a more just internet. And uh, the, this is the real reason why we speak about internet commons, digital commons, digital public goods as of this year. So uh, we all know that the commons are, it's a very multi-dimensional social uh, institution. Uh, it allows us to organize both the production, but also action in a very distributed, horizontal, open, uh, and very participatory fashion. This reminds a lot of the original design, the original architecture of the internet. Those of us, and many of us, have been here studying the evolution of the internet for uh, years, decades, or I'm, I'm not going to state everyone's page here, don't worry, but we have been working on this for many years, and we really know that the commons concept resonates a lot with the internet. We also know very well that over the past year, this ideal of the commons became far and more distant from what the reality we have. So we have a, a, a handful of global corporations that concentrate attention and data collection of users, not more than 15 global platforms. We have a handful of corporations, many of them even less than the one mentioned above. They also harvest and concentrate data in the, almost 70% of the internet traffic in their cloud servers, extracting all the insights that then is useful for artificial intelligence and any other purposes that impact, are already impacting a lot innovation and how we use digital technology. And so the, re the real reason why we are here is because this is not really sustainable. This, this, this trend is not really sustainable. And the commons as a theoretical approach allow us to have to put forward another alternative option to foster self-determination of individuals, of communities, of states. Uh, those of us that have been working with me over the past years know very well that I've been uh, uh, also advocating a lot for network self-determination. Speaking about community networks, a very good example. Community networks is a very good example of how connectivity can be managed as a commons, how local digital ecosystems can be created by the unconnected even. So this is all possible. I mean, what's, it, it's very important to remind this because in this historical time, it's really important to remind that this is not about ideology, it's about science. Uh, uh, Eleanor Ostrom won a Nobel Prize <laughs> discussing how the commons can be organized. So we are very much here 
to looking forward to understand all the stories, the insights, the governance model that all the people that are here today can uh, share with us. Uh, without further ado, I will also want to uh, just ask Adam Burns to provide a little bit of introductory remarks, and then we can start with the first segment of our Internet Commons Forum 2021. Please, Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure to uh, be participating in this, as Luca said, the third episode of the in uh, Internet Commons Forum. Um, above and beyond, I think, what uh, Luca has said, I think the grounds are shifting well beyond um, just the common treatment of access through community networks. Um, one of the themes of this year's uh, topics, well, the, the main topic for this year's um, session really is how the commons uh, uh, is changing and evolving. And I think the scope is increasing. The scope of threats to human agency, the scope, uh, the scope and threats to um, the control and um, maintenance of our own individual uh, behaviours and identities and our social, social and cultural foundations. Um, and I think we have a great lineup of speakers in divergent areas that we have not touched on in the past uh, two sessions that we've held, including the areas of um, uh, alternative currencies, cryptocurrencies, the use of cryptography as a commons enabler, uh, amongst many, many others. So I am very much looking forward in brief to participating with, uh, with all of you for the rest of this session. Uh, and um, thanks, Luca, and let's begin. Thank you very much, Adam, for kicking off this uh, third edition. And we are now starting with the first segment that is dedicated precisely to the evolving conceptions of digital commons. Uh, we have the pleasure also of having also attracted the attention, I would say, of many institutional uh, stakeholders this year. Uh, so we have a representative from the UN Secretary General's Envoy of Technology Office, uh, Yu Ping. It's a great pleasure to have you here uh, with us. Well, here, <laughs> in, in this hybrid format. Uh, so uh, Yu Ping, thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Luca. And indeed, I'm indeed privileged to be here with Henriette on site at the IGF. And I just really want to echo her and thank the others in the room as well, because those of us that have made it here really can see the spirit of the IGF, both in virtual as well as in hybrid. And that I want to echo what Henriette has said, that really there is a strong mood of cooperation, collaboration, and energy that I think comes from us now being able to be in person, but also connected online to all of you as well. I want to start by um, what Luca and Adam had said, that there is very strong institutional interest in this idea of an internet commons. And I think this is a response to the challenges of COVID and the fact that we are now facing a digital age fraught with challenges that require global cooperation and leadership to steer through. So for instance, this concept of the internet commons has found itself into the highest thinking here at the United Nations, where in his recent report, Our Common Agenda, released by the Secretary General in response to the United Nations 75th anniversary and the voices of over a million people that responded to the United Nations on the digital future that we want, there was this very clear call for the digital online domain to be seen as a global public goods. And the Secretary General himself has really seen this cyber digital online space as a commons, as a digital commons that has to be governed in the way as of other commons, perhaps as space, as C has been done. So for instance, in the common agenda, it says that the internet is a global public good that should benefit everyone everywhere. And that our approach to global governance and multilateralism really needs to take into account this specific concept. This builds on a lot of the work that's been done in the United Nations through the Secretary General's high level panel, the digital cooperation roadmap, which also points to the importance of open source technologies, digital public goods, and this spirit of openness and collaboration that characterized the beginning of the internet, but as time has gone on, has become characterized by proprietary interests, commercial interests, and really the ending of this ethos of openness and collaboration. So the question perhaps is how do we bring that back? And how do we really reinforce this notion of inclusivity, openness, transparency, and collaboration that really was at the heart of the internet and what we are collectively trying to achieve by looking at the internet commons itself. We see at the United Nations a vision of 
a more open, free and secure digital future for all. This was called for in the roadmap, reinforced through the common agenda, and really will be at the heart of what we are trying to build for September 2023, a global digital compact that will be a consensus a coming together of governments, private sector, civil society, all of the stakeholders to really agree on the digital future that we want, that we think can be built around this concept of the internet commons, the internet as a global public good for everyone everywhere. In this building towards a digital compact, we see three potential areas, and this is why I would be very interested in hearing colleagues' reflections on this. Firstly, we think at the United Nations, there will be a push on open source technologies and digital public goods. There have been recent developments in the United Nations. For instance, the member states and governments passed a resolution at the ECOSOL on open source technology, and the Secretary General is being asked to put forward proposals on how he thinks open source technologies can be used to achieve the sustainable development goals. Our colleagues, Dessa, that also run the Internet Governance Forum Secretariat will be working on this report. There are strong efforts to build greater partnerships with multi-stakeholder alliances and coalitions, such as the Digital Public Goods Alliance. I believe my colleague Lucy is here to talk about that in a greater detail later, precisely to leverage on the potential of digital public goods to help the United Nations fulfill its mandates. And in all these efforts, there's also the sense that the United Nations itself needs to build our internal capacity to deploy open source technologies and digital public goods more effectively. The Office of Information and Communications Technology here at the United Nations Secretariat, for instance, is working with my office to create an open source program office at the United Nations that can precisely help achieve this and create an, a culture of open source here at the United Nations. The second area that the United Nations is working very strongly on is on the issue of universal connectivity. And I think it does speak to the fact that we are still able to connect online despite the technical difficulties that we were able to surmount just now and still communicate like this. But for 2.9 billion people, this connectivity is a pipe dream and they are unable to benefit from the, the digital technologies and being online and the benefits of internet. So for those people, the need to narrow the digital divides and bring them online is crucial and fundamental to the United Nations work as well. The last area that the United Nations is working strongly on is I think something that our opening speakers, Adam and Luca alluded to, that even as we talk about internet commons, right now I think as, as Lucas said, the reality is more distant than it actually seems, that there are increasing pressures on internet fragmentation, the creation of separate splinter nets, restrictive policies, techno-protectionist measures, and the efforts by certain private corporations to perhaps segregate the way we operate. And in that sense, internet fragmentation is a real concern for the United Nations. It has been specifically called out by the Secretary General as a potential area for discussion in the Global Digital Compact. And this is why I think the voice of stakeholders in calling for a more interoperable, open, free, and secure internet will be critical. And we look forward to the voices of the Internet Commons community, the IGF as well, to provide inputs on this particular specific area with regards to building this consensus agreement, the Global Digital Compact in September 23. The United Nations and the Office of the Tech Envoy, where I work, remains committed to multi-stakeholderism. We will continue to bring forward these issues, digital public goods, digital inclusion, universal connectivity, through our multi-stakeholder roundtables that we coordinate, the partnerships that we have built with so many of you, and the work of the various UN entities as well. And we really look forward to partnering with you as we continue moving forward in this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Xu Ping. And uh, now, before uh, giving the floor to uh, Adam to uh, introduce the last two speakers of this first segment, let me introduce uh, a star of, well, a star of the digital commons and an intergovernance star and a good friend. I'm very honored to have here today uh, Rebecca McKinnon, that now, uh, since some months, is vice president for the Wikimedia Foundation, which is probably one of the best examples of how commons can really work in the digital uh, ecosystem. So please, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Luca. Um, I assume everyone can hear me okay, um, and that you'll tell me if you can't. Um, I'm very honored to be here today, and, and thank you for your kind words, and, and congratulations to, to all of you for uh, pulling off a, a, a challenging hybrid uh, forum. I, I know it's not easy. And, and thank you, Henriette, and you, Ping, for your remarks. I'm going to show, I'm going to attempt to show a few slides uh, to illustrate and, and humanize uh, my remarks. So please bear with me while I uh, share my uh, screen. 
Can you see my slides? Yes, wonderful. So I'm going to be focusing my remarks primarily on the policy framework that we need for the digital commons uh, to survive and thrive. Um, and I'm gonna start by talking about people because that's what this really is uh, all about at the end. And this photograph here is of Dr. Nitha Hussain. She is based in Sweden. She's a clinical neuroscientist and doctor who throughout the pandemic has been spending her downtime editing COVID-19 articles in English and in her native language of Southwestern India, and later focusing her efforts on improving Wikipedia articles about COVID-19 vaccines. And this, living almost 3,200 kilometers away, from her is Dr. Ala Najjar. He's a Wikipedian, Wikimedian of the year. He's a volunteer for Wikipedia and medical doctor who spends his breaks during his emergency room shifts addressing COVID-19 misinformation on the Arabic version of Wikipedia. And this is the uh, Arabic page for the COVID-19 Omicron variant, as it happens. Thanks to Najjar and Hussein and more than 280,000 volunteers, Wikipedia has emerged as one of the most trusted sources for up-to-date comprehensive knowledge about COVID-19, spanning nearly 7,000 articles in 188 languages. This is a very concrete example of the value of the digital com commons. I'm bringing those of us who don't speak Arabic um, back to the English version of the Omicron variant page. And the point I want to make with all of this here today is that Wikipedia's reach and its ability to support knowledge sharing on this global scale the ability to support volunteers' efforts to inform the public about a major disease, helping students study for tests, and all the other ways in which Wikipedia pages help people around the world. This is only made possible by laws and regulatory environments that enable a collaborative volunteer-led model to thrive. So I'm going to dig into the uh, history tab of the same page for, for those of you who uh, are, are not uh, Wikipedians yourself, you may or may not have seen this, but this, this is an example of how the way in which the, the site is edited is completely transparent. There's a record of all changes being made to each page. This is the talk page, also for the same Omicron variant page, and it's showing you what the rules are um, in order for uh, credible sources um, to, to be um, shared on the site. And these rules about what credible sources are, they are set and enforced by members of the community, not by foundation, which I'll talk about in a moment, but by volunteers with administrators who've been elected from the community of, the, of volunteers. And the, our, the thing to note here is that our movement's approach to content moderation is participatory and transparent, unlike the content moderation processes of some large social media platforms that have been much in the news lately. And my point in showing all of this is to point out that our open knowledge movement is not only about sharing and editing content, it's about self-governance by communities. Luca, you, you use the term self-determination. That's precisely what this is about. The communities who are not only na native speakers of the, the language pages they contribute to, they're often subject matter professional experts, and they also understand the media environment and cultural context in which each page is being edited. This is what brings the value to a good Wikipedia page. Now, the Wikimedia Foundation uh, that I work for 
supports the work of this global community of volunteers who participate in the creation, editing, and governance, and again, uh, emphasizing governance, of a range of open knowledge projects, including Wikipedia, which is the most well-known one. We have actually, uh, Yu Ping uh, mentioned ECOSOC. Uh, we have an application pending uh, before ECOSOC, and uh, we very much hope that we and many other uh, civil society members of uh, open knowledge communities um, and the digital commons uh, can advance in open ECOSOC uh, and other UN bodies. We believe we, we have much to contribute to the building of the, the digital commons. Um, so the policy framework that we are advocating for, um, it can be boiled down really to three fundamental elements. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of com complexity in each element. First of all, free speech protections. And for the digital commons, for self-governed autonomous community platforms, that means that in the regulatory environment, for, for our projects to survive and thrive, intermediaries need to be shielded from liability for third party content. And I would uh, refer everyone, if you're not familiar with the Manila principles um, for intermediary liability, um, that you do so. It, it talks about uh, the relationship between limited intermediary liability and human rights. Secondly, privacy. We need data protection laws. We also need surveillance oversight so that people can contribute to open knowledge projects to the digital commons without fear of retribution, uh, whether it's by governments or private actors, in some countries, even families. Um, we, we need end-to-end -end strong encryption. Finally, access. We need, obviously, affordable and ubiquitous broadband. We need net neutrality. And as was also mentioned earlier, a globally interoperable internet because our self-sovereign communities operate across borders and it's vital that people be able to participate, participate in open knowledge communities across borders. Finally, all governments and non-state actors need to respect and protect human rights. That means impact assessment and due diligence, transparency and oversight, stakeholder engagement, and effective grievance and remedy mechanisms so that when power is abused, it can be identified and held accountable. And I've uh, offered a few resources in, in the notes here, um, the IGF, as the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, I would also commend to you the African Declaration in Internet Rights and Freedoms that I know that uh, Henriette has had some involvement with over the years, as well as the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights for uh, non-government um, entities that operate online platforms. And with that, I thank you for your time, um, and I look forward to the discussion, and I apologize uh, in advance that I will need to leave at the top of the hour. Thank you very much. Now, let me see if I can stop sharing my screen. There we go. Wonderful, Rebecca. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. It's much. It's uh, now my pleasure to introduce someone. Um, Renata Avia, a, an act a passionate lawyer, activist, author, and now, more recently, uh, Renata heads up the Open Knowledge Foundation. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Renata, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And one year after the pandemic, I'm still missing that, you know, losing the mute, on mute uh, uh, place, but uh, it is such a great honor to be here back and to be like uh, with this group of friends and colleagues and inspiration and thought leaders that all of you are. And um, basically, I'm in this new challenge, and in this new challenge, the the most important task I think is go, uh, uh, heading back to the open knowledge that uh, Rebecca mentioned uh, conversation and not just staying data. 
what it has happened in the in the last uh, 10 years is that we have been like deep into the rabbit hole of the data obsession and and by being like so into into the data obsession we have neglected the things that like really uh, drove us the the first decade of the century that the, the things that we were like very passionate about of opening possibilities for human development and opening uh and uh, leading to more equal societies. Quite the opposite happened. And I guess that many of you are going to discuss all of this. And it is, uh, it is, um, it, it is um, um, if, I, if I read the mission of the Open Knowledge uh, uh, Foundation, um, it is still even our mission, you know, like uh, of the last, uh, that, that needs to be revisited. It's a little bit like, you know, like, uh, um, data focus and not people focus. So the reflection that I have, uh, I have had around my head in the, in the first uh, two months of my uh, leadership is this one. Data is not knowledge. It needs more to become knowledge, as we have seen examples of uh, like the Wikipedia. But it is not only like, you know, static. It's not only an encyclo encyclopedia. It's this active knowledge that transforms things through systems. And that is what the, what the logic of digital commons enables. And that is how our mission become more complex somehow. Because sometimes, like if we look back in time, the time of Wikipedia, the time of Creative Commons, it was, it was, a very, it was like the very basic building blocks of what we have today. And now what we need is to make it dynamic, make, make, it, make this digital commons a uh, living organism uh, through into the bloodstream, uh, something transversal into the bloodstream as, as uh, the other speaker said, inside the United, United Nations system, inside multilateralism, inside uh, decentralized communities. And, but the other danger that we are facing and something that our communities didn't address properly in the first decade of the century and probably that our societies didn't address for a long, long, long time is the issue of extractivism and how, uh, and that's, uh, and the tricky point uh, on how we built, we, the privileged connected, build the early basic structures of the internet from our privilege and from our exclusive communities uh, and how all the structure that we set up is being challenged right now. It is being challenged by a completely different generation of activists and advocates and movements that question, uh, 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 that are starting to question in a very, very open way and a challenging way for our movements. Or it, it, it is open just for the sake of open, but what if the communities have a say on, on their data? But what if uh, so it's not open for everybody, but it is open for everybody who's advancing uh, a global vision of survival. Uh, but all, all these, all these questioning on the, on the initial ideas of openness uh, that are like a key to uh, digital commons of who's responsible for, for it, or uh, uh, what is our responsibility we release a data set or a knowledge asset that then is used as, as, a, as the basis for a campaign of misinformation. You know, like all of this is, is uh, all, and the overwhelmingly global north presence of content, a digital content where like the rest of the world is like uh, still very absent from digital. Lots of questions that we need to address as a community. And I think that we are like less in a time of evangelizing about, about openness, evangelizing about digital commons, and more in a time of looking into what we have like uh, proposed and fixing and recalibrating, let's say, recalibrating what we stand for, adding not, not necessarily just patches, but adding, adding into our movement and to, uh, into our moving principles profound structural reforms or like uh, revolutionary changes in the, way, in the way that we see digital commons to be, let's say, to, to be something fit for purpose for the, the next 50 years. And the, 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 what we have on the other side is this, uh, in, a, in appearance, passive skilled users 
in the space of digital, digital commons, while they are at the same time very active, energetic, and energetic and engaged youth, uh, creators and interactors in platforms that keep that creation and that, uh, and that um, excitement and that um, uh, collaboration trapped in proprietary platforms. And that's, that's a very, uh, while well, I agree a lot on, on, the, on the issues that Rebecca said on internet liability and all of that, the logic of the platform is, uh, in the architecture of platforms is profoundly anti-commons unless very strong like you know principles are like a, the founding uh, architectural principles of such platforms and the internet as itself you know like it 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 is moving pretty fast uh, in its uh, architect architectural evolution to be like this space of, uh, of surveillance and control and we must not forget the political dimension of this, that it is like basically, even if we go with our communities and try to make the most resilient ecosystems, uh, politics is very, uh, is very powerful in the, in the side of the anti-digital commons, basically. Uh, economically powerful actors concentrate most of the data power and these economically powerful actors are not isolated from politics. So the question today that we need to ask ourselves is how can we bring the data power back to the people and how can that uh, data power be transformed into knowledge that impact their lives? And the thing that I have been like, the, the movement like that has inspired me the most in recent times is uh, the youth movement like really uh, rallying all over the world and against uh, extinction basically, uh, against planetary extinction. So my dream and, and, my, and my hope would be to bridge the digital commons movement with this natural commons movement and make something powerful. Make not only a resilient alliance where uh, data is transformed into power to the people to avoid planetary extinction, but where an alliance is built back to also rescue the very powerful and very important uh, no, local knowledge that is also in a in a uh, risk of extinction by being missed by digital transformation by being like discarded as irrelevant, in a virtuous circle that enables us to have sustainability in both sides, because I believe that we will not overcome the most challenging problems of the planet if we cannot if we cannot look back and look at the lessons of the past to build a resilient future where digital is just a characteristic and not it is a separate sphere or separate world. So converge, convert, converging movements is what I'm thinking of and dreaming of. And understand, of course, how uh, our digital world is like our world practically, uh, but without forgetting device of the half of the world disconnected. Um, basically, we are trying to experiment in three layers at Open Knowledge Foundation, skills, technical tools and, uh, and a sustainable ecosystem around the digital commons. I will not bore you with infomercials about our programs uh, because they will be very different in six months time. And, and basically my, my magic formula for the digital commons is this one, local impact, collaboration and empowered citizens. Um, so a vision of a digital world that is rooted in the local, in the decentralized, and in the green sustainable, and I will add even feminist digital commons logic. Thank you so much. And uh, sorry if I took too much time. No, no, not at all. Thank you very much, Renata. Thank you for your um, particularly uh, insights. Um, and uh, Yes, so next we have um, a sociologist, a strategist, a thinker, an author, uh, one of the co-founders of this Internet Commons Forum and co-founder of The Open Future. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Alex Tarkovsky. The floor is yours, Alex.
Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be joining the forum again and speaking it again and I actually want to give you in a way an update on, on a project that I presented I think at the first forum uh, at that time together with Sophie Blumen we spoke at the forum and we spoke about a vision we created called Share Digital Europe. Uh, I should maybe mention immediately since uh, this is a uh, global event that uh, we call it Share Digital Europe because we're based in Europe and we're framing things for a European debate but in a way it's a vision that we hope uh, uh, works also in other regions. Basically, it's a, to give you a very short recap, a vision that tries to shift from a debate that at least in Europe, but I know in many other places has been very market focused and the digital single market frame has just really taken root. Uh, and we, I think we can say after three years that we played a part in trying to shift that debate. Uh, we proposed uh, issues like the commons, uh, public sector, role of the public sector, self-sovereignty and decentralization. And then we start thinking, so how can this vision be brought about, especially that we probably cannot count uh, on the European policymakers to simply adopt that vision. And we start thinking, what are some good policy levers? Um, and we decided to look more closer at the principle of interoperability, which is one that, of course, is fundamental for the Internet emerges in most polity debates. I was wondering whether someone will mention it here before me and indeed Henriette uh, mentioned interoperability. So I'm very happy about that. Mm, and so we did this uh, research project supported by um, Nesta through their NGI Forward Fund uh, to ask ourselves, uh, okay, so there's a lot of policy debates on interoperability. In Europe, it's one of the more interesting aspects of the Digital Markets Act. Um, big debate, how much uh, the policymakers will force the platforms to become interoperable, but not just in Europe. For instance, in the US, there was the proposal for an Access Act, which also was a strong interoperability mandate. And of course, the obvious thing uh, is that this is a shift from talking about an interoperable internet, which still remains at this basic protocol level as it was, the shift is to the debate that the services layer to ask questions basically about the platform space, which uh, I think Renata so very well framed, uh, saying that this is a profoundly anti-commons architecture. And the big question is whether interoperability is a measure that can somehow shift this balance. Mm, and our answer, to give you the spoiler of what I will say at the end, is yes, and so what's the challenge when you look very closely at the current interoperability debate it's it's, it's a quite specific vision of interoperability and we we call it for the purpose of our paper competitive interoperability because it is first of all interoperability really framed in market terms it, it basically says that if you make platforms interoperable the online markets data markets uh, uh, online services that space uh, will become more competitive, period. Sometimes second order outcomes are envisioned, which might become the societal outcomes, but very often really this is an economic debate or a technical one. Um, and, and this is where we see the challenge that sort of still doesn't break out of this logic. And crucially, we see very little attempts to imagine, model, and vision. What happens then? Okay, so we introduce mandate APIs, let's say, we open some floodgates, we open the back doors to closed gardens, you can go back and forth, metaphorically speaking, and what happens there? There is very little conversation about that, it seems. We should be aware, by the way, that some of the uh, conceptualizations of interoperability frame that there can be risks to interoperability. It's not obvious that if you sort of create an interoperable space that can still be captured. For instance, there are examples where protocols are still controlled by the dominant players. So what's our response? We propose something we call generative interoperability. We borrowed the term generative, generativity from uh, Jonathan Zittrain, though I think it's a relatively common term. He really framed it very nicely about in his book, The Future of the Internet. And I think it has a subtitle on how to stop it, but I might be imagining things wrongly. It's a book that's by now 15 years old, I think. But it, so basically, he, has, he, he says that generative tools have the capacity to create something new, new services, new ecosystems, new worlds on top of them. And this is what we'd like to propose. If we say generative interoperability, the basic principle is, of course, the same. It's this idea that you need to ensure flows of data between varied systems, in this case, between platforms 
and this non-platform space. But um, we believe, and we're doing this also on the basis of interviews with experts. One of them, uh, Jaromil, is here. And, and thanks, Jaromil, for your support for this study and your advice. Basically, when we start asking experts on interoperability what's important about interoperability, they mentioned everything else. They mentioned co-creation of code. They mentioned good governance of protocols. They mentioned necessary public funding and very important public procurement rules, like the prototype fund that uh, was part of that short Renata's uh, um, advertising. And this basically led us to think that that we, we need, that you cannot think it's a simple principle. It's a very important principle, but on its own, it probably will not succeed. It'll work great if we create more complex projects around it uh, that think in terms of also these additional building blocks and maybe one important thing to say and hopefully it also shifts this thinking from a, a very market-based perspective to one that's either non-market or thinks in terms of new economies so we highlight for instance that we'd really hope that an interoperable space is one where a greater role is played by civic projects uh, public infrastructure and institutions cooperatives are something we're looking very closely um, there's work still ahead of us. I'd really like to do an exercise to model this space, take one of the canonical debates today on interoperability, let's say an urban so-called sharing economy or in social network space and really try to map. So what would be the openings? Who could benefit from them? And how could these actors that support the commons step in uh, to create a space that we can call in many ways, uh, but in the end uh, is a commons or is a digital public space? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, Alec. And we are right on time, having started at uh, 11.55. We have a good uh, 15 minutes now for I would say maybe 12, so that we then, if we don't have, if we don't manage to add 10 minutes at the end, uh, we will squeeze a little bit the debate. But just uh, just to introduce this first segment of debate, uh, let me first reiterate how grateful I am that you brought all these very different perspectives. Uh, I, I really uh, enjoyed very much you ping stating the importance of also open source and the intentions of the uh, general secretary uh, of the UN to bring this to the fore again. Uh, I am based in Brazil where uh, that was for many years a champion of open source. And then unfortunately these policies were um, modified, but there is always room to come back to good things. Uh, I, I really enjoyed very much the examples of Rebecca and the fact that there was uh, the st stress the need for governance and this again resonates a lot with what Eleanor Elstrom uh, is teaching I mean was teaching us before she uh, passed away about the fact that the importance of the, the key relevance of governance for commons to thrive I really enjoyed very much the enthusiasm and, and, the, and the hope of Renata with this movement that indeed have a lot of room and I enjoyed very much uh, Alex uh, 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 suggestion to also speak about generative interoperability, but there is a great but. All these things are wonderful, but I, we have them to be very pragmatic and see that in practice there are considerable challenges for this to thrive. It is possible. What is great to see here today and in our discussion is that this is possible. It's something that is possible. We, are, we, have to, to, we need the political will to make this uh, thrive, but it, it is possible, but there are, it's also very difficult. So I would like to open this 10 minutes of discussion with this question. So what is the main challenge? What are the main challenges that in your specific uh, fields, in your initiatives, you may see as really a, a concrete obstacle that does not allow the commons or in general or your specific initiative to try? Please, the floor is yours. Do not hesitate to be provocative. Maybe we could start off if uh, someone has a comment or a question. Uh, maybe we can start off with someone physically in the room. Um, Adam, I was about to say, because I'm not sure if everyone in the room is logged into Zoom. So if anybody in the room wants to just raise your hand, I'll tell Adam <laughs> that you Fantastic. want to speak. So the invitation has gone out. If anybody Thank in the you. room wants to contribute, just raise your hand. Uh, Renata. 
Um, so if, if no one is starting, I'm happy to make a short comment. Uh, I think that uh, in the digital commons, one of the, uh, sorry about the dog barking in the background, uh, one of the uh, challenges is to bring young people in, like both very, very young people. Like I'm, I'm telling that, you know, like people 12, 13, 14, 15, like in, uh, back in time, you know, it was a very young and energetic movement, the, the one uh, that uh, will see the internet and the digital commons as a possibility. Right now, we have very little to offer, you know, like uh, we have to compete with the corporate, like, you know, superpowers uh, and, and with a narrative that it is completely disconnected from digital. So that's the challenge I'm facing, you know, I'm, I'm facing this very complicated challenge of bringing in the new and bringing in, with bringing in the new, bringing in the new diverse, because when we had all these conversations about the digital commons early in the 2000s, we were like mostly like, you know, again, very like global, not the global north, but a lot of people were like very global north from certain very elite universities. And so we need to revisit our common, uh, our movement, but before as a preparatory step, we need to bring young people in. And it's very tricky. I see Henriette and then Renata, uh, sorry, Rebecca, Henriette and Rebecca. Um, thanks, um, Luca. I have a question for Alec. Um, does generative interoperability need rules and regulation? Or will it flourish um, on its own um, in the way that uh, operability has? And how do you prevent it from... Because, I mean, you talked about competitive interoperability, but surely what we've also seen is anti-competitive interoperability and, and how interoperability, if you have the power to use it, can actually become a very cost-effective way, uh, way of building um, monopolies. So, yes, so what do we need to, 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 um, for generative operability as you, interoperability as you described it, to flourish? So, so I think you sort of reinforced very well our, our challenge to, to, to one approach to interoperability. Exactly, that's the problem that, that it doesn't avoid these challenges of anti-competitive interoperability. Uh, and our solution and sort of this is a result, we probably would have enjoyed brainstorming more with experts, but online that's challenging. So I want to speak also on behalf of the core authors, which is me, Sophie Blumen and, and Paul Keller, but also people we talk with. It seems that hopefully by adding these additional elements, we improve the chances of beneficial results of interoperability. And, and generative doesn't mean organic in this sense, emergent. Uh, we also use the term generative interoperability policy. And actually our policy paper is framed within the NJ Forward program. So basically it's targeted to a large extent on, on policymakers. Uh, we think, for instance, crucial issue is the proper design of large public funds, which at least in Europe, for instance, are now being, being released uh, in the Digital Europe program. For example, 400 million for data spaces. Uh, no one knows very well what data spaces are. In this regard, I think are the, they are the policymaker equivalent of metaverse in some sense, but everyone is excited about them. So we say, okay, we should apply this principle of interoperability to them, but also understood more broadly covered in this policy package, this kind of maybe world building package. Um, and, and then I think they have a higher chance of succeeding because th there's some, I really like Ethan Zuckerman speaks about um, mm, failures of imagination. And I see it a bit in, in advocacy work and policy work, which otherwise I think is super relevant that we're pushing, for instance, in Europe for these interoperability rules for platforms. But, um, but they really stop the conversation stops at the moment where we should be opening it up. And maybe one more thing I should say more, more directly to answer your question, Andriette, we, we cover it briefly because this is just one of the aspects, but of course, protocol governance is crucial. And I think this is where, again, uh, the internet itself has a beautiful tradition of in a way deliberative or emergent protocol governance, but we also know it gets captured. Uh, but again, the, the solution is not necessarily mandating certain solutions, but we write about it, collective action around such governance, right? Making sure that we are present in these uh, pr governance procedures, making sure that actors who want to participate are properly resourced. 
and so on. Thank you. Rebecca, please go ahead. Okay, um, or we could let Vittoria respond on interoperability first, since he he put that in the in the chat. Oh, um, sorry, I'm I respond to, yeah, yeah, please. I'm if, respond if you to don't, question you about yeah, I'll respond to the question about obstacles after that. No. I, okay, where do we have to look? <laughs> Hi. No, sorry. I, 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 of course, I was late. I have to apologize. So I didn't get the entire discussion, but only the last few minutes. But I, I mean, uh, I, I was really prompted by the question since I've been involved with several NGOs and companies in actually lobbying the European Union and the Parliament and getting interoperability into the future rules for digital markets as they are being voted like next week, uh, at least for the first reading. And yeah, I mean, I, I think there's general consensus, at least in our environment, that there need to be rules. Because, I mean, interoperability is one of the key principles of the internet, and it's what allows you to choose between multiple providers and so on. And exactly for this, I mean, in, when markets have tilt and there are dominant positions, the, you need the rules to impose uh, the, the dominant companies to open up again their, their platforms and their interfaces. Otherwise, it's just in their business interest not to do this. So I do see that in some cases, I mean, a big dominant platform that is not dominant in a market enters through interoperability and then uses the, their market power to, I mean, basically kick everybody else out. But if it's mandated that they have to keep their services interoperable, then uh, simply I mean, new people will at, at least have a chance to try to challenge the, the new dominant position that they are building. Well, we've seen many of the big tech platforms that have, I mean, done exactly that, and then they shut down the, their, inter their interfaces, their interoperable interfaces, so that in the end, no one could challenge the position that they had just built. So, I mean, yes, I wanted to say that, I mean, in my opinion, yes, you really need regulation to defend the open principles of the internet. Shall I go ahead, Luca? Yeah, so just to, to, to respond to your first question, Luca, about obstacles, um, I, I, I want to just point again to the, the policy environment that is increasingly um, unfavorable globally to, to the digital commons in, in a couple of regards, one being that um, uh, by all indicators uh, across the world, um, uh, governments are increasingly criminalizing online speech um, network shutdowns are, are growing. There's just a, a range of, of policy uh, trends around the world that are not conducive to broadening participation in the digital commons, particularly in, in the global south and among young people and who, who, will, who need to be able to participate across borders um, without fear uh, and uh, without censorship and actually to just even access uh, these projects. So that that's one thing. The other concern I have is perhaps overcorrection in in the um, uh, in in North America and Western Europe. I, I wrote a book ten years ago to, uh, talking about the unaccountable digital platforms and the need to hold them accountable. So I, I certainly agree that that accountability is needed. But I'm I'm worried that in seeking to regulate the big tech. Um, uh, digital platforms and their toxic business models that uh, a lot of uh, provisions and measures are being recommended and in some, in, in some cases put into place that are harmful to the digital commons, um, place liability on, on people who are trying to participate in open knowledge projects. And we just need to make sure that, that governments uh, think beyond what the internet is today. Uh, speaking of having an imagination, to, to think of what is possible, not just what, you know, the internet is more than just Facebook and Google and Twitter and Amazon. What kind of world do we want to build? And how do we make sure that we put in place the policies and laws that actually protect the, the, the existing pieces of that world that already exist and actually support its growth and thriving? And, and that's, I think, the, the biggest challenge that we face right now. Thank you, Rebecca. Your point was particularly poignant to me in terms of your point on liability, um, because, again, it seems to me that uh, 
attempts at commons have started from infrastructure. So actually a lot of burgeoning uh, internet um, community networks have faced liability issues for the provisioning of physical access. And we seem to be going up in layers in terms of people being impacted by this very point of liability. So thank you. I had also a very brief comment on this on what Rebecca was saying about the need not only to uh, when, we, when we want to regulate and actually this is some that, something that someone that has dealt with telecom law has learned very well already at least 10 years ago, which is that if you only have in mind the big corporation, the big telecom operators, you will not allow and you regulate them they will be able to bear the regulatory burden, but the small entrants, the community network, for instance, or the, uh, the small enterprises will never be able to bear the same regulation. So you will simply kill them. The same things apply to uh, platforms. If you only have in mind the Google and Facebook, Google and Meta, uh, you, you will, they will be able to add another compliance department and, be, and deal with the regulation, but the small entrants or someone that is known for profit like Wikipedia or Wikimedia, uh, they will never be able to comply with the, with the, this kind of burden. So it's necessary to have a progressive adjustment, and to, because if you only have in mind Google and Meta, you then you end up having only Google and Meta because they are the only one able to comply with the law. Uh, and then I really liked the, the Victoria's comment about uh, interoperability, the need also to have uh, sustainable policies. Uh, we are actually going to speak about this both tomorrow with regard to. Uh, device neutrality and interoperability, and on, on Thursday, uh, with regard to platform uh, uh, interoperability. So, if for those that are interested in, in this debate, I'm just uh, having, I'm just sharing this uh, advertisement. Uh, is there any other comments to finalize this first segment? Otherwise, we can then pass the floor to uh, uh, Alec and uh, Jane for the second segment. Do we have any final remark, comments, anything? Well, we are perfectly on time then. So, Alec, Jane, please, the floor is yours to introduce our next uh, segment. And thank you very much for the panelists of the first segment. Especially, it was fantastic to have a majority of strong women with us. So, when for those who uh, complain about not having women in panels, well, you just have to invite them because there are a lot and they are very good. So, with uh, having said that, let me uh, give the floor to another strong woman I really enjoy very much working with, Jane Coffin, and then Alec, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. Um, I really enjoyed that last session, and I don't know if you saw my note in the chat, but I'm, I'm always amazed that we have abandoned markets and um, people trying to prevent us from providing connectivity in those markets. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today with Alex. Um, I think I'll quickly... Um, uh, introduce uh, our speakers and then turn it to Alex for other comments and then we'll, we'll roll on. But I just want to highlight that we have Lucy Harris, uh, who's the co-lead for Digital Public Goods Alliance with us. Um, the Digital uh, Public Goods Alliance is supported by UNICEF and Lucy will tell us more, but she's working on um, discovering and implementation, implementation of digital public goods. And it's exciting to have Lucy here today. It, um, that syncs really well with Yuping being here as well and the potential for a digital compact in 2023, which is exciting because that compact will need to have this digital commons approach uh, in it because we're not going to connect the next 3.5 billion without it, those abandoned markets. We have Osama Manzar, a good personal friend from the Digital Empowerment Foundation. I've worked with Osama for many years and he's been at the forefront of providing connectivity, but also social programs for inclusion. Um, and we have Dennis Yaromil, uh, Royal, whose name I hope I pronounced correctly at the end, from Dine.org, who works at the intersection of art, science, applied cryptography, and more. He's an inventor of digital tools and operating systems um, and open access networks. Alex, over to you for more comments. Okay, I actually think we, um, not much more commenting is needed right now. We should just give uh, our speakers the floor. Uh, we're continuing uh, a, a conversation from the first part. Uh, digital public goods were mentioned at the very beginning, so I'm very keen personally uh, to learn more about this initiative. Lucy, we're very glad you're with us today. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone who spoke in the first part of this conversation. 
think teed this conversation up so well and was uh, super interesting. So thank you. I am also going to share my screen here. Let's see, is that visible? Excellent. Uh, so as mentioned, my name is Lucy Harris and I co-lead the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative of the government of Norway, the government of Sierra Leone, the Indian think tank iSpirit and UNICEF. So I'd like to uh, open today with a quick story about digital public goods. So uh, in Sri Lanka, the first suspected case of COVID-19 was actually registered on January 27th. And realizing that travelers were still pouring into the country as a popular tourist destination, immediately local developers got to work building a COVID-19 tracker. So their tool focused on the registration and tracking of travelers arriving from regions with a high risk of COVID infection. And it was created within two days of that first registered case and deployed at Sri Lanka's airports just days later. So the reason they were so successful is that they weren't building this tracker on its own. They were building it on top of DHIS2, which is an open source health information management system and a digital public good that's already in use in Sri Lanka. So the speed and efficiency with which Sri Lanka was able to respond to this crisis is not even the most impressive part of the story. DHIS2 is already being used by countries around the world. And that meant that when Sri Lanka shared their user guide with the global DHIS2 response team, the tracker was able to be implemented in a further 38 countries and is being adapted for use in 14 more today. So the tracker isn't just a great piece of technology that was created rapidly and deployed rapidly. It's also something more. Because it was part of an open source project, it meant it could be modified when the problem was spotted, COVID-19, could be adapted to fit a new circumstance and a new need, and then it could be shared back with a global community of others who were able to benefit from that solution and solve the same problem in dozens of other countries. So technology itself doesn't solve societal problems, but we can use technology to solve them. And the way that technology is designed and developed matters. This idea that how technology is designed and developed matters isn't new, but there has been a growing focus on the idea of digital public goods. Make sure my slides change. Uh, and that's largely driven by, I think, a recognition that the process of digital transformation needs effective, adoptable, open tools. So as Yu Peng mentioned in the high-level panel on digital cooperation, the UN Secretary General recognized the potential of digital public goods to reduce fragmentation and duplication, and said that all actors, including member states, the United Nations system, the private sector, and other stakeholders should be promoting digital public goods open source solutions that adhere to privacy and other applicable laws, standards and best practices, and do no harm. So this combination of ideas is what we call digital public goods, or DPGs, to keep things a little bit shorter. They really harness the power of the internet to create thoughtfully developed digital solutions that deliver shared benefits and solve common problems. But at the Digital Public Goods Alliance, we wanted to make this definition even more comprehensive because it's easy for people to think of DPGs just as free software, but there's so much more than that. When we talk about digital public goods, we're talking about a solution that was designed and developed to advance the sustainable development goals, that is open source, and that has taken steps in how it was set up to avoid and mitigate harm. Uh, Wikipedia, who spoke earlier, is a great example of this. It was built collaboratively collaboratively, it's available for anyone to change and modify, and it presents a solution to a common problem. Uh, and I love what was said about the way it thinks about privacy and protecting human rights in the way it's set up. So we have set up uh, working collaboratively with experts from many organizations, including Mozilla, Creative Commons, uh, Chaos, and other to create the DPG standard, which is a set of nine indicators that creates a baseline requirements uh, that must be met in order to earn recognition as a digital public goods. So solutions have to be designed and developed as open projects, which means using open licenses, but also having good documentation, uh, non-PII data that's accessible, uh, that they have a commitment to following standards and best practices, and have considered other components of do no harm. And if you like open standards, I recommend you take a look at the website. This folds out into a much more detailed document that you could take a look at. 
And solutions can test themselves against it. They can build to the standard, but they can also submit to the DPG registry and they'll be reviewed by the Digital Public Goods Alliance against this standard. It is also itself an open standard. It's an open source project. It lives on GitHub and can be contributed to by anyone. So having framed a little bit about what digital public goods are, what is then their role in creating a kind of digital commons? Why do they matter for a healthy internet? So as many people discussed uh, earlier, the internet is a powerful tool and there was this dream that it would democratize and create equal access, but that's not what's happening today. As everyone here knows and was well discussed, there's a huge disparity in those who can connect to the internet and those who can use it and those who understand how it works. The world is divided into those with access and those without, those who are given the internet to consume and those who can use the internet to create for themselves. Pioneers of the internet envisioned the online world as a commons, this level playing field where every voice would be heard. But that's not what's happening today. It's dominated by a handful of companies as, uh, as was discussed earlier. And I think we believe that closed source proprietary solutions are contributing to this. They're limiting the diversity of players, voices and creators who can help from and shape the internet. By contrast, open source solutions provide greater access to technology by providing people control over the tools that are shaping their digital lives, empowering people to solve problems and create for themselves. Moreover, when someone's access to the internet is filtered through a proprietary platform, the things you can do are limited and shaped by the interests of the creator. When people's access is filtered through digital public goods, they can design and adapt those platforms to meet their local needs. And moreover, those local innovations can be openly shared and built on in turn, just like what we saw in Sri Lanka at the beginning of my talk. This next wave of digitization could either create opportunities for million, millions to become the builders, maintainers, and creators of their digital environments, or even more deeply divide the world into those who create and those who consume. Digital solutions must retain the ethos of the internet that powers them, and core technologies, software, content, data, AI models, and standards with the potential to shape society need to remain free, open, and accessible as digital public goods. Thank you very much. I will find out how to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you, Lucy, that was excellent. Um, you gave us an overview of what a digital public good is, how it interfaces and why it's, um, how it helps with tech and des um, designing um, more open um, problem solving uh, solutions and helps us with um, looking at the bottlenecks to privacy and creation that are inherent in some proprietary networks. Um, and thank you for reiterating that how tech is designed matters for the effective ado uh, adoptable uh, for adoption and for public tools and where DPG can help solve common problems and shared solutions. And it's great that you have the support of the United Nations and some governments and other organizations with you in this. And I think it's really great for people to hear more about what you're doing because this will definitely probably filter into the digital compact coming up. So thank you for that. We'll move on to Osama Manzar from the Digital Empowerment Foundation. Osama, you're up. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible to all? Okay, thanks, Luca. Uh, you know, when everybody was talking about Internet Commons, I was thinking that can we put Internet Common Sense Forum? Or do we need Internet Common Sense uh, kind of thing? And uh, yeah, so I, I, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, start from a couple of ground stories, uh, which actually uh, reiterate the fact that uh, how much Internet has been appropriated by uh, the corporates, the business, the governments to create their own narratives rather than the Internet of people which, war, which has no more internet of people. And that's the reason why we are looking for internet for commons and internet of commons. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so last year after the first wave of COVID, we got a call from one of the tribal areas of Southern India. And they said that we are in the hills of tribals and we 
we are very secluded we have our own tribal hospital we are uh, we have our own craft we have our own language and uh, these people were friends and they said that you know now covid has totally secluded us we can't sell our craft we can't tell the world that you know here are the things that you know we want to sell uh, and you can buy one because of the restriction on movement and so on and so forth so we put on a community networks and they could able to sell and they could go out their hospitals started functioning with external doctors and uh, you know consultancies and so on and so forth uh, and then we said that why don't you also put lots of computers because we have seen that you become suddenly more consumer of internet rather than a producer on the internet and we don't want to consume external content too much to influence the local community you know and 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 we would rather like to uh, publish ourselves and our content and so on and so forth so i don't want to go further but they were very conscious of using the internet for the way they want to use the internet and not the internet wants to use them uh, i got another call from a lady who is a great traveler and uh, uh, she is an environmentalist and she said that all the storytellers in the villages they are suffering without getting tourists coming to their areas and uh, their earnings have totally secluded you know and they they are unable to earn any money so can we can we start a website where we publish our local storytellers story in their language in their style and not translated in english primary even if it is translated it is not uh, to compromise in their local style and their originality we have started it we paid them and and, and as soon as uh, we started talking about scaling it up and why not just to record it and translate they just backed out they said no we want to publish the way we want to publish you know we don't want to uh, you know uh, be uh, 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 losing our local culture in the garb of translation in the garb of internet in the garb of higher reach and so on and so forth and then there is this third story uh, we all know that covid also uh, you know created a whole situation of misinformation and fakes huge huge amount and most of the time local people were suffering and in most of the places where we had internet and where we had community radio most of the people were tuning in community radio to find out what is uh, believable and trustworthy news or information rather than the internet information or internet based information which is certainly the mode of uh, internet based information is whatsapp and facebook and you know all social media and so on and so forth which they think is is the culprit of all the misinformation and fake news and here we had to use community radio to broadcast information to fight misinformation and fake news so these are the three stories that we realized is that even though even even if we have used community network wherever we go the people use internet more as a consumer than people use internet more as a citizen and and that's a huge uh, challenge um with the spread of the internet and all that so the question is that are we being uh, appropriated by internet or are we appropriating internet or only those people are appropriating internet who are powerful and who need uh, you know narratives to be spread and then you know i started uh, thinking and uh, could that rebecca sh showed a lot of those pages which actually bring in local content on wikimedia uh, and wikipedia uh, i just searched the internet and india has got 645 distinct tribes 645 distinct tribes do we have 645 internet commons no we don't you know are we being cult you know uh, uh, you know compromising on our culture i again searched another thing how many languages do we speak or do we have india has got 122 major languages and 1599 other languages almost 1600 other languages and 122 major languages do we have as many as internet commons 
No, we don't. Will we have? I don't know. We might be writing obituary of many of these languages on internet rather than appropriating internet into so many languages, not to lose their culture, not to lose their heritage, not to lose their um, uh, tradition, and, and so on and so forth. So, so the the the, the uh, question, and and I am not giving any any uh, solution here, but we are asking ourselves, and we need to ask ourselves, is that how do we take to global south because half the world is still unconnected, and incidentally, this is the half of the world who is unconnected is more diverse, more having deep culture, having more deep traditions having deep, uh, different diverse languages, and so on and so forth. So sh do we need to design internet? Do we need to design, uh, uh, you know, community networks? Do we need to design, uh, you know, connectivity in such a way that every internet become more local, more and rather than become more global, you know, because the global is, is, is creating more consumeristic uh, way of uh, pervasiveness rather than the other way around. And, and I want to close with, again, lots of question is that how do we uh, design the Internet Commons to be as diverse, as multilingualistic, as colorful, uh, rather than becoming one color for all? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Osama. Um, the digital, digital determination and an Internet Commons that's uh, multicolored, multifaceted versus one one color um thank you for that really those great stories and also just helping us take a look at self-determination and collective governance from a different perspective um, your story about the pandemic and the different tribes is um, something that we all need to take in uh, bear in mind when we're looking at how to create co-create um, that digital compact how we co-create together whether it's a community network or it's local content that is determined by local actors versus outside actors. Um, our next speaker is Yaromil. And Yaromil, over to you. Thanks. Many thanks for inviting me here. It's my first time at the Internet Governance Forum. I interacted uh, in the past with some people working at the UN and uh, that was funny. It was over uh, internet radios about 15 or 20 years ago. Um, can you see my slides? So, yeah, I uh, direct and represent this organization. It's more of a community organization, so I shouldn't say direct, actually, I'm facilitating it. Since 94, um, uh, I'm second generation of this community. Uh, it was a ham radio amateurs and uh, bulletin board system, BBS operators. So before the internet, let's say. And uh, being second generation, I joined as a point into a BBS and then I joined the worldwide sensation that uh, the internet was for us. I remember clearly the first uh, application that really made a difference to BBS was the internet relay chat, the IRC, because it was synchronous. And it allowed a bit more exchange. Today we went uh, far from that concept into a lot of uh, multimedia exchange and various uh, dimensions of connecting to each other through the internet. And I think I will try to speak about that complexity, provoking a little bit of thoughts going beyond the open source concept. We work as a free and open source software foundry since uh, uh, 2005, uh, mostly for the European Commission. Uh, for which we worked uh, on this flagship project, Decode, back in uh, 2014, 15, and 16. Decode led to uh, what is the actual discourse in the Commission about uh, um, data, personal data, and sovereignty, technical sovereignty, digital sovereignty. And what I argue to be an important concept for us when we talk about open source, algorithmic sovereignty. So this was the subject of my uh, dissertation and uh, lucky for me is the subject of also of an amazing artwork by Pavel Kuczynski, 
uh, it uh, uses this metaphor. Uh, you remember when we came out uh, uh, Pokemon Go, it was quite a worldwide sensation and uh, kids stormed around in our cities, sometimes also uh, blocking entries to public buildings or walking on, uh, on train rails. So putting themselves into danger because an algorithm of a game uh, established somewhere else was uh, putting incentives in doing so. So was putting little little uh, uh, puppets that they had to collect into places that the algorithm didn't really know well. This provoked a lot of problems. I remember clearly uh, the police in the Netherlands issuing a warning to public institutions, the mayor of New York being concerned of releasing a public speech about this. Uh, it shows you how uh, algorithms are important today. They govern the way we are um, receiving our, our, uh, our taxes, our pay out, paying our taxes, uh, how much we are valued by insurance companies. Uh, algorithms are also establishing if we are paying soon, how much we are paying for what we want and probably how much we are paying for where we want to go already with travel companies. So why I say it's important, it's because sometimes when we talk about open source, something that was very important 20 years ago, now it appears to be a, an accepted, uh, an accepted uh, posture and methodology to bring together the industry and the scientific research world. When we talk about open source, often we are drifting the discourse into a technical space that excludes people from understanding what is really happening. And this way it also excludes people from understanding how decisions are taken, because not all of us are coders. And as hackers should know very well that uh, sometimes we protest about the 1% of the world being uh, deciding about the future, but uh, on the internet, it's us hackers being the 1%. We are the privileged. And this privilege should not make us think that just making something open source is enough for making it ethical within a process that should include people in decisions that are affecting their lives. What happens if we do not? I think it's clear, it was clear also in our research, there will be social unrest into this uh, increasing uh, invasion of platforms into the real world. The way Airbnb establishes its rules in how a city can be rented out to tourists can actually provoke unrest. This was a picture I took on my way to the Onassis Center when I had to give a similar speech, a keynote uh, in Athens uh, last year. Uh, uh, just a demonstration passed in front of me and they leafletted uh, what you see. This is the result of financialization, precarization, and deterritorialization, which are not dynamics that are provoked by the internet. But we should be concerned because the economy of the world is changing as we speak, because we are facing a, quite a tsunami on macroeconomical level after the pandemic, or I like to call it syndemic. And this synergy of factors that will put us in, in difficulty uh, is affected by decisions that are taken on algorithms that, uh, that involve our life and are excluding people from decisions. So why do we have a platform that does social networking and put us in touch when we have no vote on this platform? Nowadays, platforms are sort of societies. They almost like, like governments, but they are governments that do not, allow, do not allow democracy to be in place. People cannot vote on the decisions that are taken about these platforms. Perhaps some leverage can be given by, uh, for the people by initiatives like this, like the Internet Governance Forum. But we have to be very clear that open source is not enough. It was the beginning 20 years ago, and nowadays we are looking at a pervasive presence of algorithms and the connective tissue of the Internet that need to push us forward and claim back uh, a sort of agency on the decisions that nowadays are taken by a technocracy, just programmers, just us. Ultimately, I leave you with a question. Whether we are developing to perceive the machines or be perceived by the machines. If I look at the current industry incentive to actually monetize people uh, interacting 
uh, with each other. We are developing technologies that allow machines to perceive people. But this brings no real um, feedback to the people that are using these platforms. They leave them rather blind to what is happening around them, and sometimes outraged by what changes their rating or their visibility on a YouTube channel. Uh, to the point they may storm the headquarters of YouTube and, and shoot people around in desperation because all what they had was that visibility, that channel, that sort of uh, um, platform for their, for their narcissism. So I don't want to be judgmental here about what the platforms or the people are doing with their presence online. What I argue is that we need to envision a design of technology that allows people to perceive what machines are doing with them. Because only this way we can have participation and transparency and understanding of the environment in which we are. Some references of the publications we're doing and uh, yeah, after this quick advertisement, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Yaramil. And I don't want to sum up what you said, but I want to just make um, an observation that you sync really well with Lucy's point about the importance of how tech is designed matters. I loved your point about machine perception versus human inclusion and perception. Um, open source is not enough, as you said. It, it leads to questions about lock-in um, from tech. Diversity is important. Digital colonialism is in front of us potentially. Digital determination is important, digital inclusion versus exclusion. And it really is um, a little scary when you're talking about the algorithms. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Alex to help moderate the next session, which is a 15 minutes of Q and A. Um, I think um, I'll turn it over to you, Alex, so you can help uh, let everyone know how you want them to raise their hands or type something in the chat to, to um, um. Both things will work, but but uh, before we start, I quickly wanted uh, I'm I'm sharing Jane sort of your um, reflection after Yaromil your talk, and I, I feel as if it adds a, a layer to our conversation, which I thought is sort of two dimensional. I really liked how Osama brought this local perspective, this this pers contextualized perspective to a conversation which I frame more as systems, which I really like about the digital public goods framework that tries to work at scale at this highest level of systems. I had systems, individuals, very nice. And then you added basically machines. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm scared by it, but, but I agree with you. We need to add that perspective and it needs to be done by exactly the type of technologists like you who understand these issues, but openly say, we need to bring these issues to the broader population. So um, thank you very much. And please talk about these issues more in conversations like this. Um, we have a bit of time for uh, some responses, comments, questions. I'm happy to take them both in chat and uh, to see you raise your hand or simply start speaking. We're a pretty small um, group uh, here. I'm not sure whether anyone is monitoring the YouTube, whether there are any comments there, but probably that's too late. Anyway, anyone would like to share their thoughts also on the whole, Adam, you seem to be saying it's a big, <laughs> big space that we open. YouTube is too big. Too big, yes. <laughs> oh, I think Luca actually wants to speak. Go ahead, Luca. Yeah, I have, I mean, as people uh, seem to be a little bit shy now, I will take advantage to start uh, to uh, get, get a little bit of comments that actually can lead to some reactions from our speakers, which is, uh, I mean, again, I think I'm a very pragmatic person as uh, people that know me know well, and I really want to, to try to understand how uh, things in practice can be, uh, can be built, right? Uh, we are speaking about uh, digital commons, digital public goods, and there are a lot of very good ideas and very good critiques. But then when this comes to, the, to a very uh, pragmatic 
layer, if you want, that is very difficult then to put it into practice. Uh, I like very much when uh, Renata was mentioning before to try to find some sort of convergence with other movement to uh, try to motivate people. Uh, I mean, it really reminded me of an opposite conversation I had with a YouTuber a couple of weeks ago telling me that actually nowadays every, every children, every, every teenager wants to be a YouTuber. And this is very, a, a very lonely life because if you want to record yourself saying any kind of things and then sharing this on social media, you are all, almost always alone. And it's it also, so this is a very great challenge we have in building a commons is also in the, in the pandemic is not helping us. <laughs> it's, it's also to having people together uh, sharing ideas. And I mean, these kind of platforms like the Internet Commons Forum is a very embryonic uh, step towards bringing together people that are like-minded, understand these kind of things, are scared about a little bit also about the, the, the kind of trends that we are witnessing and trying to put together something. I really liked the, the, the suggestion by Yu Ping that was uh, uh, done via, via Twitter of also trying to contribute to the contribution of the uh, digital public, uh, the, the, digital global, the digital global compact, because that is, is something that could, could have an impact. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, this is necessarily the best possible way to try to have a, a concrete impact. But so my question would be for our speakers. So what do you think that in practice, uh, in the various dimensions that you described from the uh, uh, 600 shades of commons in India uh, to the, 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 the digital public good challenges to how actually algorithms are now uh, uh, regulating all our lives. And it is the even less than 1%, 0.1% of the global population that really understands what's going on. So how do we transform this scenario that we have now, which is not really the best possible we can have, into something that could be maybe not the best possible, but something better, and that includes uh, a, a, a vision of commons of digital public good. So what, what would be your, your pragmatic suggestions? Would one of the speakers like to take that on? I can uh, take a... <laughs> <laughs> that was the algorithm taking it on. Got some feedback. It was um, Pikachu. It was Pikachu creating. Pikachu. <laughs> that art is really going to haunt me. That picture with Pikachu riding the saddle. Um, but to try and get to kind of a concrete example, because I think in some ways it's easy to talk about like the doom and gloom version of the situation we're in. But I also think, you know, the pandemic. Uh, and I think a renewed interest in what digitization looks like and how to do that in a way that's ethical and equitable. I think there's an opportunity at the moment right now, especially as um, huge portions of the world are coming online and joining the internet for the first time uh, right now. And I think that creates an opportunity. And I'll, I'll talk about this from the digital public goods perspective, which is uh, I think the pandemic has especially created an awareness of the need to have kind of digital infrastructure within societies. Things like what I mentioned, kind of digitized health systems, digital ID systems, civil registration systems that are digital because of uh, the opportunities of being connected. And when things like a lockdown happen, those who have access to kind of digital education suddenly are flying ahead of the others. And so it really creates this need. And I think there's an awareness in this moment that we need to be looking at some of these like infrastructural level digital systems. And that of course is scary in some ways because if those are designed incorrectly or if they are deployed incorrectly, it can cause a huge number of problems. But in kind of from the optimistic standpoint, it also unlocks opportunities, especially from my perspective, if those solutions are digital public goods. So if you make the infrastructure of a society built on open source solutions, and digital public goods are not just open source, because I agree with uh, Jeremy that open source is not enough. They are also designed explicitly with the sustainable development goals in mind or doing good in mind and have taken steps in the way they were designed and developed to address issues of privacy, security, interoperability. So if you have those systems 
as the infrastructure of societies, I think it creates a lot of opportunities for people to uh, look at and understand the technologies that are guiding their lives. Like, I think it gives us an opportunity to look at the machines, right? Like, what is the code behind the voting system that I'm going to use? I have found a bug and I'm going to report it in this system that actually is our civil registration system. And I'm going to build something that builds on top of the national digital system that's in place in my country because I see how it works and I have the opportunity to understand it. So I think that's a very kind of concrete uh, vision for how we might move forward that takes advantage of the kind of growth of the internet commons and layers on top of it digital solutions that then make that a common public resource that other people can see, use and understand and also uh, modify. Adam Luca, just to tell you, there is someone in the room who wants to ask a question whenever you're ready. I think we can go ahead, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Niels Brock uh, here with DW Academy and also with uh, LockNet uh, Initiative. So the question goes to Luca, uh, to Lucy Harris, and somehow also to Yu Ping still. I was asking uh, how to onboard like the private sector in those ideas that you have, uh, so to say, the digital cooperation roadmap of the of the UN, and also when it comes to the digital public goods. So uh, you even mentioned uh, private uh, sector as uh, people or organizations that would sustain like uh, public goods that seems uh, at odds at the beginning. So what is in for them? What is the buy-in? So uh, how is the ethos of open collaboration? Uh, uh, yeah, why should they uh, buy this? Uh, which it seems to be anti-profit to be a bit uh, provocative. I'm happy to go for that. Or if you ping, you want to kick us off? Sorry. Sorry, what's that? Lucy, why don't you start and I'll finish off. Sure. So I think there are a number of reasons that the private sector is interested in engaging. Um, the first is a, a brand thing. So there is kind of this greenwashing, like open washing. Uh, this is like my cynical answer and I'll get to less cynical, cynical as I go down. Uh, being able to say, you know, we understand that there's this global need uh, and that our tech not that we have a huge disproportionate amount of power and we're interested in kind of supporting the sustainable development goals and we want to show our affiliation with kind of the UN system and those goals so we and we have a component that we want to open source or that's already open source and we want to see it recognized as a digital public good. Moving slightly less cynical there's the uh, idea that there's also value for them sometimes in having a piece of technology that either they maintain themselves suddenly freely available and it can pose um it can create opportunities for others but also for them so i mean a great common example is uh android which is an open source operating system and there was kind of a total the market was locked up in uh like apple and by creating android and then giving it away for free making it open source suddenly people all over the world are building on it and it totally undermined the kind of capture that had already happened in the market. And then they could layer on proprietary versions and uh, make money. So it was a way for like a business move in many ways to disrupt the kind of lock in that was already happening so that they could have a voice in the market. And then by doing that, they also created opportunity for many other people to build on top of it. So the reason it helps create innovation for others can also be a motivation for them to release things as open source solutions as well. So those are, I think, there's both of those. There's this desire to do good on some level and a desire to be branded as doing good. And I think there's the fact that, you know, also supporting other digital public goods, if there's an open source ID system being implemented and you're like Google Pay, that means that you can see the code and build more easily an interoperable, like make it your Google Pay system interoperable with that digital ID system. So it's going to be easy for you to roll that out. So they also benefit the same way anyone else benefits when solutions are, are open source. To add on to what Lucy said, I do also think that this is the time that we really do call them to account for the fact that they've made humongous profits and that in some ways they've really taken advantage of the 
open infrastructure that exists in the internet because without the foundations that were built, they wouldn't be seeing the kind of profits they have today. So this is the time where we really say, you know, you've benefited and now it's time to give back. And we at the United Nations really have been the recipient of many of these tech companies who are now coming to us and like Lucy said, are really eager to engage with the UN. So this is our opportunity to then use this coming to the UN and the international community to say, now these are the expectations that we then have for you. To go back to what Luca had said, this is where I do think the Global Digital Compact is an opportunity to precisely tell the private sector and the tech companies, this is what we want from you. Because it's not just about civil society talking to member states, but it's also opening the conversation to say, this is what we expect from the private sector companies who should be part of this Global Digital Compact in building this future that we want. Also then putting the onus on them to agree to this vision that we all collectively have of the internet. So no longer just us accepting what they necessarily are providing in terms of services and so forth, but really us also laying down the expectations for what we want for their continued use of the open internet that they have already been so lucky to benefit from that was built from the efforts of so many of us around the table. Thank you for that, Yu Ping. Um, you and Lucy have given us some additional food for thought with respect to how we might be able to scale the movement um, from the digital commons to the digital uh, public goods. Um, if there's no other, if there's no other questions, we could turn over to Henriette to help us with a sum, a sum up, and maybe another observation or two. But Henriette, can we turn over to you? Um. Hi, Jane and Riet here. Yes, I am trying. Again, as with the last time I was asked to do this, I find the Internet Commons Forum really quite uniquely challenging and inspiring um, in the context of the IGF. So once again, just thanks to to, to Luca and everyone else that, that worked with him in, in pulling this together. I think that... Um, I mean, what I've heard and, and my, my takeaway thoughts are that we need lots of different things. Firstly, we do need practice. I think building the commons is, is, is a practice, and it's very powerful because it's a practice that we can all participate in. Um, there's Wikimedia, Wikipedia, um, building open knowledge, uh, being part of open source. We can build um, digital public goods. We can all be part of that. We can use the digital public good standard that Lucy told us about. But we also heard that this is not enough. And in fact, not only is all this openness not enough, it also creates vulnerabilities. And in a way that that, that openness of the internet and of what we use it for um, creates, as, as Yu Ping was just saying, this, this, the basis on which so much appropriation and concentration um, has taken place. Then next we need human rights, and Rebecca made that very clear. But we also need to look at human rights um, uh, and th potential threats to human rights that comes with building the, the um, digital commons. Lucy talked about digital ID systems, for example. And you know, do we have frameworks that can manage all that data that goes into the commons in a way where individual rights are protected? Um, then we need policy and regulation. Um, I think it's really important, and it was really good to hear Alec also talk about how they're thinking about that. We need policy and regulation that can encourage and enable the commons to grow, but we also do need to look at using policy and regulation to constrain practices and efforts that undermines um, the commons. But then again, as Rebecca said, um, we need to be careful about the risk of how regulation that tries to target large platforms, um, uh, how can we avoid that not also creating um, new barriers of entry that could actually limit innovation from the bottom and from the edges? Um, the internet is more than these platforms, and and we 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 even regulators, even the Europeans who are doing relatively well in in building regulation, need to not be captured by the notion that everything on the internet that needs regulatory intervention is defined by these large platforms. They are just companies, after all. But, but looking at constraining their impact is important. Then we need incentives. And I think, again, Alec mentioned that. How can we use creatively financing um, 
to 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 create incentives for, incentives for growing the the commons in in different aspects, um, different ways. There are lots of different ways in which that can be done. Then another thing Alex mentioned: collective action. I think this is very exciting. We need collective action to monitor. Um, to celebrate the commons when we do actually manage to, to grow it and, and strengthen it, to protest against its uh, encroachment, um, and also to disrupt. I think, I think maybe Dennis was, was on the edge of that when he talked about the, you know, the, 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 the hackers community, but I think we also need to look at disrupt, disruption and disruption practices as being part of our project. Um, I, I'm curious to, to also think more about the technical layer. You know, we sometimes take for granted that 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 there is um, this layer of protocol governance that Alec talked about and generative interoperability that actually underpins what we can do to 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 grow the Internet Commons. So, thinking about that, thinking about who the actors are that are behind that and how we can engage them more effectively in this debate. Next, I think we do need some intervention at the level of principle. And I think this is really the last thing. I think we do not yet, yet have a consensus. Uh, I certainly don't see a consensus on not just using the internet as a platform for growing the commons and for enabling digital public goods to thrive. I think there's agreement on that. What we don't have agreement on is that the internet itself is a commons and that it should be governed as such and recognized as such. And I think that's very, very different. It's a very different step and a very, it has different implications to just looking at the internet as a medium or a tool for growing digital public goods. Um, I think Luca mentioned the work of Eleanor Ostrom. I've also looked at the work of Inge Kohl, who, who writes about global public goods. And I think we have two from, from in terms of economists, we have two really useful schools of thought to draw on here. Ostrom's work on the commons, Kohl's work on digital public goods, and others. And I think we need to do this work. I think we have a conceptual and political um, task ahead of us to, to look at how we can deepen the understanding of the internet as not just a platform, um, but actually as, as a commons. Um, I think we can look at using the idea of the Global Digital Compact um, to take this debate further and, and try and get some kind of basic understanding and agreement. Um, not easy. And I think that's the final thing I want to say, really. I think this is not just one of those win-win, um, happy, clappy processes. I think we often tend to talk about things at the Internet Governance Forum from this perspective of all stakeholders agree, all stakeholders um, you know, are on the same page. And I think as, as your question um, about the private sector, it's a really relevant question. I don't think this is going to be easy. I don't think member states at a UN level will agree, I don't think businesses will agree. And I think for me, the really exciting challenge here is can we use our multi-stakeholder processes, processes like the IGF, not just to agree, but actually to disagree and work through that disagreement to come up with some kind of common understanding about how to really recognize and protect and promote the internet as a commons. So that's it, back to you, Luca and Adam. Thank you very much, Andret. And as in, in, despite having uh, started with some means of delay, I'm, I'm, we are reminded by the technical support that we have to close down in, uh, I think, one or two minutes. So I would simply, I mean, I will use your concluding remark, Henriette, as uh, an excellent wrap up of this session. Actually, you facilitated a lot our work and uh, we are taking notes to then share this as outcome of this session. Uh, we, are, we are very happy also that we challenge you, but we inspire you at the same time. And uh, this has been yet another excellent uh, Internet Commons Forum. We really hope that next year we will have some a little bit more time and maybe also time to organize better things over the year, maybe in synergy with the office of the UN Tech Envoy uh, with regard to the Digital Global Compact, because I think that this is a very interesting opportunity that we should seize. 
Uh, I would like to thank everyone for their excellent uh, presentations, really thoughtful, inspiring as usual. Adam, please, over to you to conclude this third edition of the Eastern Conference Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Um, I, I agree with everyone. I think the, the range and the depth of um, thoughtfulness in this session has been wide indeed. Um, again, uh, I, I think I've put in the chat uh, humorously, perhaps UNESCO should declare the internet as a significant cultural heritage start site to protect against the capture of our digital commons. I don't think that's going to happen, but um, nonetheless, I think the, the people at this um, session are part of um, the, the, the forum that, that has um, really tr tried to examine these issues. And I thank particularly, again, all the speakers, including uh, Jaramil, who's entered the IGF for the first time. He's been brave enough to, to jump the fences and, and dive through the hoops to get here, and we appreciate that. Um, so I don't really have more, much more to add other than I still believe that algorithms, machines and systems have no idea of locality and space in, in human perspective, and I will argue they never will. We need to keep our agency, we need to keep fighting, and we need to keep our passions, and we need to talk about them, communicate with them uh, to each other. So on that note, um, Luca, Thank you again for doing the hard work behind the scenes to, to organize this session once again for the third consecutive year. Thank you very much, sir. It's always a pleasure to, to work with such a great team. Thank you. And let's uh, build more between now and next year at the InterCommons Forum 2022. Thank you very much to everyone. Bye bye. And so we are also finishing on time. Bye bye. <laughs> right. Great. Thanks, Luke. Take care, everyone.